tonight. Welcome to each one of you. Do we have any guests with us tonight? Anyone at all? I know one of our missionary wives, Mr. Teach, Teach Out, is here, and we're glad to have her and her daughter here tonight. And anyone else have a guest with you? Or you are a first time guest? Anyone raise your hand? Okay, it's family night here at, Fair, at Valley Forge. Where are we? <laughs> at Faith Baptist. Can we rerun that? Uh, here, here is, and I've got it written out. Faith Baptist, glad to have you here. Brother Mark Pate, come and lead us in prayer. That's a tough act to follow, but we will try. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the privilege of gathering in your house uh, this evening. We thank you for our Sunday school and our time together this morning and, and what a blessing uh, your word was. Thank you for the beautiful rain that you've sent us, Lord, and we just praise you for that. We do pray for Brother Abby tonight as he uh, brings your word. Open our hearts now, Lord. Help us to be receptive to those things that throughout this week, Lord, would uh, just allow us to honor and to glorify you. We do want to lift up uh, some requests. We do uh, pray for Barb and uh, just continued recovery and strengthening. They can find out exactly what the problem is there. I uh, do pray for John and, and Larry as they care for her. Lord, we do pray for uh, Pastor and Debbie, Mark, and Claire as they get ready to uh, come back to the states and uh, Lord just thank you for this opportunity they've had to visit the Holy Land and what a blessing that must be and Lord just give them safety as they uh, travel back and, and, and rest and recover uh, we do pray uh, this week we have uh, several of our folks uh, that will be working at camp uh, throughout the summer be leaving and, and getting settled there uh, this week and over the weekend and just pray that you'd give them uh, safety in that and again, that you would bless in our time together tonight. And we ask all of this in your precious name. Amen. Well, we sing this morning about uh, glorifying our God for sending his son to this earth to die on the cross. And then we're going to sing this evening about victory in Jesus. Because of that work on the cross, we have victory. And it's not, we're not fighting a battle that we hope we win. The battle's already won. Christ has already won the battle, and that through Christ, we already have victory in him. We're going to read this verse together, 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We'll read that again together here in a few minutes. But through Christ, we already have victory. So let's stand together as we sing 353. 353, victory in Jesus.
wasn't great, but it was better. Let's sing to 239, 239. Think about these words as we get to sing them together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. Let's sing together 239. seated. We're going to take a few minutes here and just read responsively. I'll read a verse and then you read a verse. We'll read through two passages together. Uh, just uh, read on the next slide and uh, let's read some scripture together around the victory that we have through Christ. The power of Christ's work on the cross. That power over death. That power over sin. Uh, so let's read together. In Romans 8 verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Nay, all, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And then we'll skip to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54, and, and will you start? So Oh, death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. And let's sing together number 666. Arise, my soul arise. One of my favorite hymns, 666.
to the excellence that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ and to the glory and praise of God. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you that we have the privilege and the freedom in America to assemble together tonight. Father, thank you for the word of God that you've given to us in our language that we can read it, we can understand it. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that teaches us your word. And thank you that we can be with brothers and sisters this evening and pray, Father, that through your word you'll strengthen each one of us. We thank you, Father, for the presence of the Holy Spirit. We pray for the power of the Holy Spirit as well tonight in our time together. May all that we say uh, be in honor and glory to you. Thank you for the good time and, and music today, uh, throughout the day, the songs we've sung, uh, what we've heard musicians play. Thank you for it. Thank you. It's been uplifting. And thank you that there is victory in Jesus Christ. Bless our time now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's interesting that Paul does not open this letter by using his title, Apostle. He just says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ. The word apostle indicates Paul's authority to discuss some weighty matters with a local church that he's writing to. Uh, but this is a personal letter to the Philippians. It's not intended for uh, general circulation as some of the other books were. It's meant just for the Philippians. Uh, this book was written about 10 years after Paul had uh, founded the church, and Paul still loved and remembered what they had done for him. Paul uses a softer tone as he, as he comes to the Philippian church and writes them, and because there's so much love that he has uh, for this local church. And the other reason is there's really no issues going on. In Galatians, there were issues. At Corinth, there were issues that he had to write about. And when it comes to the Philippians, at least at this point, uh, there aren't any real strong uh, glaring issues. It, it's a love letter that Paul is writing uh, to this church. Paul wrote with two things on his mind and heart, to thank the believers for helping him uh, when he had a great need, and then he wanted to tell them why he could be full of joy despite his circumstances. Remember, he's, in, he's in, uh, under arrest right now. So he's in prison but circumstances cannot, could, could be a joy robber, but not for Paul. Paul's circumstances are not great. He's uh, house arrest. Uh, he can't go out and visit. Uh, he can simply be there with the guards and do some writing, writing different churches. Uh, but he cannot go outside like probably and have the freedom uh, that the others have. So this is the same Paul that, remember, when he was in jail in Philippi, at midnight, he and Silas are what? They're singing. I don't know about you, but if I were in jail, and at midnight I'd either be sound asleep, or I'd be crouching over in a corner, scared to death for what's going to happen. But here's Paul and Silas, praising the Lord, singing Amazing Grace, maybe victory in Jesus. Who knows what they were singing, but they were just so thankful they could be in prison for the gospel's sake. Just throw out some things to you when we think about circumstances. If you're living today for happiness, then you're going to live an up and down life. If you're trying to find happiness in everything rather than joy, uh, happiness is going to come and go. It's going to be great one day. It's going to be down the next day. When your circumstances change, uh, your happiness will change to, to sadness and, and to disappointment. You might say that happiness is, is kind of skin deep. It, it's kind of surface. It can change quickly. It's like an emotional roller coaster. You're happy one day, happy one moment, and then something happens, something changes, uh, and now from the mountain peak, you're down in the depths of the valley. But joy, and that's really what we see here in, in the book of Philippians, joy throughout 
uh, the book. Joy is a gift from God. It's, it's in the heart of the spirit-filled deli- uh, uh, believer. Circumstances, good uh, or difficult, uh, cannot affect your joy. It'll affect your, circum- or your, your happiness, but it's not going to affect your joy. Joy is the fruit of the Spirit, listed there in, in Galatians chapter 5 and in verse 22. Paul was a Spirit-filled. Paul was full of joy, especially when he writes this letter to the Philippians. This letter to the Philippians, filled with joy, in fact, uh, joy or rejoice or rejoicing, some form of the word of rejoice, uh, is used 19 times in these four chapters. It seems like every other or every few verses, uh, Paul is talking about joy of the Lord or rejoice in the Lord or be happy in the Lord, be strengthened in the Lord and, and find your joy in the Lord. It's all about joy. Uh, you know, we probably have known people around us from time to time that are not a joy to be around. You don't have to raise your friend, friend or hands, but... Do you think you've got any friends like that or people that you know that they're just not joyful? They're just sad. They're, they're under the weather, it seems like, uh, all the time when you're around them. But this is not Paul. Paul was filled with joy. Paul's the kind of guy that you want to be around all the time. If you're in prison at midnight, you want to be around Paul. You want to have that joy of the Lord, someone there to fellowship with. And I think Christians, believers, we, we ought to be joyful people. We ought to be full of joy, not filled with our circumstances and letting them affect our joy or lack of joy. One commentator put it this way. He said, joy is a supernatural inner excitement over who God is, his worth, what God has said, his word. What God has done, his works. How God has done it, his ways. Joy is a heart add to the reflex excitement and pleasure over things eternal. That is where our joy comes from. It comes from God. It doesn't come from our circumstances. Circumstances such as a bad day or disappointments or distress or Uh, a job loss or a health issue, or even in a jail like Paul's in, uh, cannot take away the joy of the Lord. I think one thing that comes close to taking away the joy of the Lord is golf. (sighs) There's just something about that golf game, that circumstance that can, can almost rob you of the joy of the Lord. I don't know what it is, but it's just something like when the ball goes right and the ball goes left, and when you're playing with three other guys in a foursome and you come in fourth, there's just something about that game that almost can rob you of your joy. That's why I, like, I prefer playing with three people. At least I come in third, <laughs> you know? Margaret said, how'd you do? I said, I came in third today. How many played? Three. Oh, yeah. But, it, you know, circumstances can be a joy robber, but it wasn't that way in Paul's life. Paul, so we see Paul's affection uh, for these people is clear throughout the letter as he encourages them to live out their faith in joy and unity. I, I believe, really, uh, Paul enjoyed fellowshipping with this church because uh, he describes them as what true fellowship is like. True believers, spirit-filled believers, believers with a joyful heart. He sees that in this church. And even though it had been 10 years prior to this letter coming, he still thinks about this church. He still prays for this church. He still is concerned about this church and still uh, thankful uh, for this church as well. Remember back in in the book of Exodus in chapter 16, uh, several of the people that were saved that had joined uh, the church at Philippi. Uh, Lydia got saved and joined that church. The soothsayer was saved and, and joined that church. A jailer was saved and joined that church and, and many others. The church had grown. Paul's 
one of Paul's, you know, it's hard to pinpoint uh, Paul's favorite verse or a verse that reflected his life because there's so many in the book of Philippians and other portions of scripture that he wrote. But here in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21, for to me uh, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's the theme verse of, of, of chapter 1. So let's go into Philippians chapter 1, and uh, we'll start here with verse 1. Paul and Timotheus, Timotheus, rather, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. We have a new position. Notice Paul says here, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ. I pray tonight that you are in Christ. Christ. If you're here tonight and not, you're not in Christ, please see someone after the service tonight. But if you know Christ is your Savior, the Bible says that you are in Christ. This old world uh, may change, but our position in Christ will never change. Uh, in Christ, you are here at Pensacola, but you are in Christ. A great position. The only position to be in is being in Christ. It's a personal letter. As he writes here uh, to the church family, he says in verse 1, to, uh, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Apparently this church over the 10 years had grown. And now they have established a, possibly a building. They have brought in a pastor, a pastor taken over. Uh, they have deacons working and assisting with the pastor. And uh, he is just so thankful, this church, uh, for its growth. You know, this church at Philippi is, is like what our missionaries are out doing all the time. They're establishing churches and uh, building up the work. And pretty soon, uh, because they're a missionary, they're, they're working their way out of a job. And they turn that church over to uh, a pastor that comes in, and then they go on and establish another work for the Lord. And this is what Paul has done. He established his church, turned it over to a pastor. They grew. They brought in deacons. Paul goes on and establishes other churches. But he, I really think Paul was a missionary with a pastor's heart. Because as you read through the book of Philippians, you can, you can just sense a pastor's care, a pastor's heart for the people at Philippi. I know we had the opportunity to help start a church years ago, and, and there's just nothing like uh, that initial starting of a church. Uh, there's a lot of work involved, but there's nothing like it when bringing in the cribs out of the cars on Sunday and establishing a, a room where your service is going to be held, and you're bringing in the hymn books and and sometimes pushing the piano in and all the things that need to go on. But there's that first group of 20, 25, 30, 40 people that come. Uh, there's nothing like that group, the bond that's in that group. And it, you, you can kind of sense that with, with Paul here. That little group that started, that little church that started in a small group and now it's grown and, and they've got a staff and they've got deacons and it's just growing. And, and But it's a church that Paul started. And so his heart is with that church. He loves the people there. He's concerned about these people. We find here in verse uh, 2, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I think sometimes we, we get upset with our kids or our grandkids because they fail to, to appreciate small gifts. Uh, I'm sure it's, it's happened in our home. It's probably happened in your home as well, or you've been to a party where the particular grandchildren are opening the cards, and they're, they tear open the envelope, and they tear, you know, open the card real quick, and, and a small check drops out, or a $5 bill checks out. And, and they go, boy, that sure was small. That wasn't very much. Grandpa's, you've been working, you're retired, you can't do better than that. You know, they're, I think they're thinking to themselves. And sometimes they even forget to, to thank the person for the small gift. Well, I wonder, do we take time to thank God for his gift? 
The gift that's mentioned here in verse 2, grace be unto you and peace. Do we take time to thank God for that small gift of grace, that small gift of peace? Or do we just go on our lives and we just kind of take it for granted and, and we move along day by day, but we forget to thank God for that gift that gift that he mentions here in verse 2 of grace and peace. It's a familiar greeting that Paul gave to all the churches that he wrote to, but it's a, it's a gift of grace and peace that we need to be thankful for each and every day. And I wonder, do you express that gratitude, that thanksgiving? Think to yourself, when was the last time I thanked God for his grace? What was the last time I thanked God for the peace? You know, without the grace of God, you don't have the peace of God. That's why the world kind of runs wild searching for happiness because they, they've never experienced grace and therefore they don't know the peace that passes all understanding. Be sure to thank God for that gift that he's given to us. Well, let's look down. Now we got through the introduction of the first two verses, verses 3 through 11. Paul has three thoughts that describe true Christian fellowship. And he writes it here in Philippians chapter 1. First verses through uh, 3 through 6. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. First of all, Paul says, I have you in my mind. Paul has them in his mind. First of all, he's God-minded. The secret of Paul's joy really was, was being God-minded. He lived for Christ and the gospel. Uh, what is a God-minded life? Well, it's the attitude that says it makes no difference what happens to me just as long as Christ is glorified and the gospel shared with others. And we see that with Paul. Even though he's in prison, he's sharing the gospel. He may be in chains. He may have soldiers around him. What a great opportunity. You know, we would just kind of be shy over in the corner and say, well, I'm in prison. I guess this is God's will for my life right now. But Paul looked at it as, as an opportunity to preach the gospel, to reach the palace for Jesus Christ. He looked at it as a, a different mindset because he was, he was God-minded. His circumstances didn't bind the, the gospel from going forth. It enhanced it. He had a great crowd around him most of the time of the guards and those working there. He was also other-minded. We see that in verse 4. He said, Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy. Can you imagine that? Verse 4. Always in every prayer. He prayed for this church. I assume he's telling the truth because it's in God's word. God's word is all truth. So I assume that's what Paul did. Because that's what he said he, was, he had do, would do. And I'm thinking, wow, can you imagine that? Praying for the same church every single day. That kept this church in his heart, in his mind. You know, we, we have in the back table uh, our missionary list, our folder with all the missionaries listed. And I've, I've divided it up into five days. So Monday I pray for these these five or six, and Tuesday, these five or six, and, and move through the whole pamphlet uh, over the week. But the fella I pray for on Monday, he's not going to get prayed again for until next Monday. You know, and Tuesday is the same, Wednesday. And, and I thought, well, maybe I need to change my prayer time and, and the way I pray. But can you imagine that, Paul, praying for uh, this church every single day? Probably pay, prayed for the other churches every day as well, because he was so thankful for them. But he says, in every prayer, he remembered this church. You know, I think we're in Paul's situation. He's imprisonment. 
isn't it something that he's thinking of others? He's not thinking about his circumstances. He's not thinking about, oh, me, what am I going to do? Uh, he's thinking about others. He wasn't disappointed in Christ leading uh, his, in his life. He wasn't depressed over circumstance. He was under arrest. His friends were outside. They were free. But where did his mind go? Well, it went back to the believers at Philippi and to the joy they brought to his life. Paul loved them, and they loved Paul as well. And so I throw out to you, when others think about you, are you a source of joy to them? When your name comes up in a, in a conversation or someone thinks about you or they, they see you in church, what comes to their mind? Does joy, oh, that person is a joy-filled person. Oh, that person is always expressing joy. Or do they look at us and say, oh, don't go by them. Go down the other aisle. They're not filled with joy today. That guy's never filled with joy. How come? You know, God wants us to be filled with joy. Paul was filled with joy. He's writing a church that was filled with joy. And he wants each of us to be filled with joy. Be a joyful person. When people think about you, they think about, wow, Joy. Look there in verse 5. He says, For your fellowship, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making requests with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the day, from the first day until now. Thankful for their fellowship in the gospel. So we've talked about, remember, Paul's confined. It was this church that, that had been such a blessing to him. He had a financial need and, and they helped him out with it. They prayed for Paul. You know, there's nothing like Christian fellowship. There's nothing like sitting down with, with other folks, uh, singles or couples together, and just, just have a time of talking about the Lord and thinking about what God is doing in our lives, thinking about the future that God has for us, and, and just think having a spiritual conversation. You know, it, it's fine to talk about sports, and it's fine to talk about uh, the kids and, and different activities, where we've been, where we're going, what's happening in our lives. But the, the joy of the Lord comes out when we can sit down and just talk about God. Think about what Jesus Christ has done for you. Think about the payment that was paid for your sins. Think about the new life in Christ that you enjoy. Think about the, the precious promise of of eternal life, spending eternity with God. You know, those, along with the other conversations, those are the kind of conversations we ought to have with one another, expressing the joy of the Lord with each other. And then down in verse 6, Paul says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul is confident, or uh, fully persuaded. It's a work of God, a work of God that does, God does in a person's heart, in a person's life. Paul is grateful to hear about the work God is doing in their hearts, in their lives, their, their salvation, their, their spiritual maturity. It's all of God, and God begins the good work at salvation. You are a good work. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, God has already begun that good work in you when he saved you. God wants to continue that, that good work, and he will continue that good work till either you pass away or the rapture. God has given us the Holy Spirit to teach us his word. God has sealed us with the Holy Spirit. We are secure uh, in him. Now God wants us to grow. Paul said, he wanted the church here to continue to grow. He says, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it. In other words, he'll continue it until the day of Jesus Christ, until Jesus Christ returns, that, that maturity in one another. And I think, you know, I know that's God's desire for each one of us. And I believe it's pastor's desire for everyone at faith, that we would be growing, maturing in our faith in Jesus Christ. 
So Paul says, I have you in my mind. And then number two, he says, I have you in my heart. There in verses seven and eight. He said, even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. Paul has them in his mind. He has the Philippians in his heart. When he thinks about the heart, this moves a little deeper. It's possible that for someone to have a mind about someone but not have them in your heart. Maybe you know people that are in your mind and on your nerves. Ever have somebody like that? Well, Paul says, I have you in my heart. In my heart in bonds, in verse 7 there, both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. He's in their heart in bonds. In bonds, Paul was probably referring to his imprisonment, whether it be Rome or Philippi or some of the other places uh, that he was in imprisonment. How did Paul express his love for them? One way he proved his love for them was by suffering on their behalf. Paul's in prison because of the Philippian people. He's preaching the gospel to them. He's out on street corners preaching and teaching. And, and because of all that, now he's in bonds. He's in bonds on, on their behalf. And I think, too, the other bonds that he's there is the bond between the Philippians and he. He had this tremendous bond, not only, not only in prison, the bond of imprisonment, but the bond of unity, and the fellowship, togetherness that he enjoyed with this, this church. He's writing from prison bonds, but he says the Christian bond, the partnership we enjoy, partners in heart, partners in suffering, partners in proclaiming the gospel, partners in the grace of God, partners in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's writing to these folks, thanking them for their partnership, thanking and praying for their, their time together. We sing from time to time, I guess, uh, communion, uh, the, the ties that bind our hearts together. We see here, I think, that kind of relationship. Yeah, he was confined, confined to uh, imprisonment and those bonds, but there was a, a bond of unity with this church, a sweetness about their fellowship, a bond of love between Paul and this church body. And then he says here in verse 8, talks about the fellowship. For God is my record how greatly I longed after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. The word bowels means tender mercies or compassion, a deep affection. It's the kind of love expressed by Jesus Christ on the cross when he took your sins and my sins and the sins of the world and gave his life. That's that kind of deep love. Paul's sincere love for his friends could not be distinguished. It could not be hidden. Have you ever longed to uh, see a friend or a couple with whom you share fond memories? We have a couple like that, Gordon and Fran Bowman. In fact, they visit here several times. We've been the best of friends for over 55 years. And uh, several times we've lived near one another, but mostly uh, different states. But they're the kind of friends that, that uh, when, you, when you get together, you just kind of pick up where you left off. It's almost like you, you're right in the middle of a conversation and you departed. And now when you're back together, you pick up that, the end of that sentence and you continue on the conversation talking with one another and sharing the blessings of God one another and what's going on in their lives and I think this is like Paul uh, he has a longing to see the Christians at Philippi he has a love for them affection for them based not merely on his past experience but upon the unity that comes when believers draw upon Christ's love so Paul says, I have you in my mind. He says, I have you in my heart. Now number three, he says, I have you in my prayers. Look down to verse nine. <clears throat> he says, in this I pray that your love may abound yet more 
and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Paul found joy in his memories of the people at Philippi and his growing love for them. Paul changes, prayer rather changes things and it changes people. The best way to influence someone, I think, is to pray for them. Maybe you don't always know the struggles they're going through. Maybe you don't know the specifics, but you can pray for them because God knows what's going on in each of our lives. And so we can just commit it to God. I'm sure Paul didn't know everything that was going on in the Philippians' lives, but he knew to pray for them and knew that God knew what was going on. He prayed that there be maturity in their Christian character. There in verse 9, Paul prayed for their spiritual maturity, uh, their discernment. If we really love the Lord, uh, we will have a desire to continue to grow in our faith. Here he says in verse 9, he focuses, the focus of love is knowledge here in verse 9. <clears throat> if you truly love someone, uh, you'll want to find out as much as possible about them. And that's why we study the Bible, to find out more about God and God's will for our lives. So he focused on uh, love that is part of knowledge. And then he focused of love, his focus of love was on judgment or discernment. Here it says in verse 9, judgment also means discernment. The focus on discernment. Uh, learn all you can about a person, and then discern how you can help them. And this is why we study the life of Christ. I want to know what, how Christ lived and what Christ wants from us. What does Christ want from me? How does he want me to live? How does he want me to respond to different uh, situations that come in my life? The only way I'm going to know how Christ would respond and the way I ought to respond is to study the life of Christ. So he says here in verse 9 that you abound yet more and more in knowledge. Get into the Word for us today. Get in the Word, study the Word, know more about God. And then he says, and in all judgment, discernment, if I want to discern what is right, what is, what is excellent in life, what God wants for my life, I study the life of Christ. I read what Christ has done and what he wants me to do. Here are two good tests for us to follow as we experience spiritual discernment. Number one, ask yourself, the way I live, will it make others stumble? The way I live, will it make someone else stumble? Number two, the way I live, will it make me ashamed if Christ should come today? Good questions to ask yourself from time to time. <clears throat> Am I living a life to please God? If the way I'm living or things that I'm doing, is it a stumbling block to others? And then number two, the way I live will it make me ashamed if Christ were re would return at this moment. We find verse 10 that you may... Paul says that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Three reasons, I think, why we need a love that grows more and more. It's needed to approve things that are excellent. It's making excellent choices, right choices, based upon the Word of God, not based necessarily on society or man's thinking, but on God's thinking. What does the word of God say? How do I respond to this? How do I handle this circumstance? How do I have the joy of the Lord through this circumstance? Because circumstances can be a joy robber. I don't want that to happen in, in my life. So as your love grows more and more, as your knowledge grows more and more, you make excellent choices. It's needed to be sincere and pure. Keep your eyes on Christ. Live a, a pure life while waiting for his return. And then it's needed to keep us from causing others to stumble. We must guard against being a stumbling block to others. And I think back over the past years of, 
of believers who uh, had some worldly habits in their lives that caused, I know, of other Christians to stumble. And, and that's something we have to be very careful with, that the things I do, the things I say, the places I go, what I look at is not a stumbling block to a young believer, to someone who's trying to grow in the Lord. So he's concerned about the maturity, the growth of the character of the Philippian church. He wanted these people to mature uh, spiritually, to mature in their Christian character. He wanted them to mature in Christian service as well. Look at verse 11. He says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Someone, one of the commentaries put it this way, verse 11. Every genuine follower of God has his glory in view by all that he does, says, or intends. He loves to glorify God, and he glorifies him by showing, uh, showing forth in his conversion the glorious working of the glorious power of the Lord. Showing forth the glorious power of the Lord. Paul wanted them to be filled and fruitful. Don't be just saved and satisfied and just getting through life. Paul encourages them to be filled with the Spirit, to, to mature in the Lord, be fruitful in the Lord. You know, when, when you are Spirit-filled, you will produce fruit. Fruit which will be seen by others. That fruit includes is included in the fruit of the Spirit there in Galatians chapter 5. That living a holy life, bearing fruit, a giving praise with our lips. A spiritual maturity means that my whole life brings glory and honor to Jesus Christ. Over in John 15, verses 4 and 5, says Jesus speaking, he says, Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Without Jesus Christ we can do nothing. Fruit is not limited just to soul winning. It is so winning. Sometimes we, we leave it at that. But really in John chapter 15, if you read through John chapter 15 sometimes, uh, it mentions answered prayer, joy of the Lord, a love for God, a love for others. They're all mentioned as fruit in John chapter 15. Abiding in Christ means, as it mentions there in John chapter 15 verse 4, abide in me. Abiding in Christ means believing he is God's son. Receiving him as Savior and Lord. Doing what God says. Continuing in faith and loving one another. That's abiding in Jesus Christ. And I trust tonight that you're abiding in him. You're abiding in the Lord. You're abiding in Jesus Christ. And I pray that this if Paul had founded Faith Baptist, this is a letter he could have written to us. He prays for us every day that, that uh, we would continue to grow in the Lord and, and love for one another would be strengthened and encouraged and we'd be maturing spiritually and we'd be joyful and we'd be filled with the Holy Spirit of God and people in Pensacola would know all about it. Paul's relationship with the Philippines was much more than just a mere friendship. It was true Christian fellowship. They were in his mind, in his heart, and in his prayers. Folks, this is the kind of fellowship that produces joy. So let me ask you tonight, <clears throat> how are you doing living for Christ? How are you doing living for Christ? Is there joy in your life? 
Are you living above the circumstances and demonstrating the joy of the Lord? As we find expressed here in the book of Philippians as Paul writes to this church at Philippi. I trust you will have a joy-filled week for the Lord this coming week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, for the Bible that you've allowed us to enjoy, to have, to hold, to read, to learn, to memorize, to study, to apply to our lives. Lord, help each one of us who knows you as our Savior. And I, I believe folks here tonight are saved. They know the Lord. Help us to be spirit-filled, joyful people. Loving you, giving you our best, giving you our all. Help us to grow in the Lord, mature in the Lord. Lord, use us this week. We will run across people who do not know the Lord this week. We will run across people who have allowed circumstances to rob them of the joy of the Lord. So I pray that we will be the kind of believer that you want us to be, that you gave your life for on the cross of Calvary. Lord, use us this week as your instruments to influence this world around Pensacola, Florida. We love you. Thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.